You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan on this second day of September 2014. And this is another edition of Questions for Corbett, a.k.a. QFC, where you supply the Qs and I supply the As. And we have had quite a few Qs coming in lately, and uh, not an episode of QFC in sight to dispel those Qs. So let's get uh, get to work and start answering some of these questions. And of course, as always, I'd like to remind you of the many, many ways that you can get your questions in for this podcast series, including, of course, just emailing me, just uh, using the contact form on CorbettReport.com. You can also use the new SpeakPipe application to record an audio message asking a question for me. You you can also uh, send your emails, uh, your questions in via Twitter. Just use the hashtag QFC. You can also post a YouTube video, either with a hashtag QFC or questions for Corbett or something like that so I can find it. And if you do, pr- preferably if you send the link in directly, it'll be easier for me to find that uh, that video. But as I say, there are many, many different ways to get your questions in, and let's get right into it today. So we have a lot of questions, and the first one up, when we open up the mailbag, comes from David, who writes, I originally wanted to move to a BRICS country, or possibly Germany, in order to escape the tyranny of US dollar hegemony as well as to insulate myself from the inevitable economic crisis that will arrive with the dollar's demise. However, after hearing your opinion of the NATO versus BRICS false dichotomy, I am left without a good idea. Your thoughts are appreciated. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you for that, David. Um, This is a very important question, isn't it? And I'm sure one that's on the minds of an increasing number of people around the world. As the uh, amount of people who are renouncing their U.S. citizenship continues to go up year after year, I believe it hit a record uh, in the last year of data that's been made available as well. And as a result, they are now, uh, the last I saw, they are quadrupling the price of renouncing your U.S. citizenship. It's now over $2,000 just to say that you are not a U.S. citizen anymore. That is, uh, th- that's just hostage-taking, isn't it? But uh, but at any rate, there are more people who are thinking along your lines and thinking about how to get out of the country and even get rid of their citizenship because they are afraid of what's coming. And I certainly sympathize and understand that perspective. But as David writes in this, I have my own misgivings and reservations about the BRICS um, as some sort of savior in all of this. And Specifically, people who are interested can go to a, an international forecaster editorial that I wrote just a couple of weeks ago talking about the BRICS New Development Bank, the NDB, that is going to be a type of rival or complementary institution to the World Bank IMF. And a lot of people have been talking about how this new development bank is going to, you know, significantly change the way things function. And it's not going to be like the World Bank, which has all these conditionalities for its grants and loans and funding and aid. Uh, this is going to be a, a different different structure whereby China and the other countries involved in the BRICS can give money to poor African nations for genuine infrastructure development and genuine poverty alleviation. None of these strings attached will dictate your policies, will dictate your economy. You must provide, you must uh, hire all of our, our corporations to build your infrastructure, etc., etc. So that's the idea of it. But as I pause it towards the end of that uh, that essay, basically the what we're being ramrodded into is the idea that there is a happy good side to the globalization. The BRICS are going to be the the good unicorn and lollipop side of globalization, and of course then America and the Washington Consensus and the IMF World Bank and NATO is the bad side of that globalization. And look, there's good globalization or bad globalization. Which side are you going to pick? And as always, I want to stress that they are trying to ramrod us into that dialectic because, of course, they don't want you to think about the fact that there are other ways of thinking about this dichotomy, which is not a dichotomy at all. It's not a two-choice dilemma. There are many, many different choices, one of which is decentralization. Why is it we are always posited as centralization is the only possible way that we can go? Either you, you sign on with this global institution or that global institution, but don't even think about trying to uh, take power back down to the local level or even down to the individual level. Oh no, heaven forfend. 
So I I am very wary wary about this idea that the BRICS are going to be a savior. I'm also wary about the idea that they're going to be this rising economic giant because clearly they've been engineered, or certainly China, the Chinese economy, as I've gone over in this podcast in the past, has been engineered into the very spot that it's in today to be this economic power of the 21st century, and that that could easily be de-engineered away. And uh, and. One thing that I think is a constant in all of this, and one thing that the uh, the the New World Order gang likes to operate on, a principle that they operate on, is the principle of surprise, of introducing elements that you, you don't expect. And I think that one of those surprising elements might be the fact that at the end of this, once this shakes out, the American economic hegemony that we've been living under since the end of World War II may not be at its end. In fact, it may be at its zenith. Now, this is uh, an interesting idea. It's one that was recently um, posited by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in an interview that he did with Lars Schall. And uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything Ambrose Evans Pritchard is saying in this interview, but I think it is worth watching because he does make some interesting points and certainly of by far of any mainstream MSM type uh, economist, I think Ambrose Evan- Evans Pritchard is one that uh, that is worth listening to and one who actually covers some of these topics that are worth uh, covering. I think the first person I ever saw that was covering the uh, German gold repatriation idea. So... I don't know how things are going to go, obviously. I don't have a crystal ball, but I think it's naive to believe that simply moving to the BRICS countries is going to to be some sort of economic bulwark. It may be for a time. There may be a time where we are going through a, an engineered downfall of the, the Western countries and an engineered rise of the developing countries, but in the long run, I don't think this is going to work out for the average person in any way, and I think just trying to escape to another country in order to you know, prolong the inevitable is not really the kind of solution that we're looking for. I think ultimately, no matter where we are in the world, the solution is going to come down to that decentralization and how we can uh, uh, affect that. And uh, and I've done a lot of work on talking about complementary currencies and alternative currencies. I want to do some more work on the idea of free banking, which I, I think is uh, another possible out for from the system that we're being engineered into. There are many different solutions. Um, the only question is which one will we choose and hopefully it's not one that leads us down another blind alley of globalization so thank you very much for opening up that uh, can of worms david it is an important one to to continue talking about and pondering as this planned and engineered economic collapse continues to unfold but along similar lines talking about the BRICS and the confrontation with the west and all of this let's turn to brian who writes I watched your recent Crashes of Convenience video and was puzzled that the item about Putin's own plane having occupied essentially the same airspace as the MH17 within the hour of the shootdown did not have any mention. Have you discounted that theory completely? Could you indulge me with some background on that so that I may not put so that I may put the possibility to rest for myself? Yes, Brian, um, don't worry, be puzzled no more. In fact, I covered that that point specifically in the open source investigation on MH17 that's up on CorbettReport.com uh, right now and that that, uh, that podcast presentation was based on uh, down in the alternative positions uh, s- uh, section of that article. I wrote, uh, quote, a report originally posted to RT.com shortly after the downing suggested that the real target of the missile might have been President Putin's plane, which was said to have been scheduled to fly over the exact same airspace as MH17 less than an hour after it was shot down. This claim has since been retracted, and RT has noted that Putin has been avoiding Ukrainian airspace altogether since the recent coup took place in Kiev. So this, I think, is another example of that phenomenon where the original story gets a lot of traction, a lot of people pick up on it, it spreads and disseminates very widely, and then the immediate retraction receives almost zero coverage so that uh, people don't know that it's been retracted. But it is the case, that original story came from RT that almost immediately thereafter, the next day, they took that article down, it's been scrubbed from their site, they put up a, a different article that says that uh, that Putin avoids Ukrainian airspace. That was, as far as I know, complete misinformation that uh, that got out at that time. So, um, so no, that doesn't seem to be a factor at all in the MH17 takedown. All right, let's move on to Twitter, where we got a question from at C underscore devil, who wrote... 
Think the public's apathy to events could be a good thing if it makes them less reactionary and harder to mobilize to war? Now, this is an interesting question, isn't it? This is certainly wishful thinking. We, we could be hopeful that it is the case that, yes, we do see all this apathy taking place uh, in, in the world right now. And, of course, we've documented this and talked about it in BFP Roundtable and other uh, podcasts and places besides. This, uh, this phenomenon of the general widespread apathy in the face of absolutely overwhelming, ridiculous uh, tyranny and over-the-top military police state abuses and and just everything that's going on right now it is amazing to watch the the general levels of apathy amongst the public and unfortunately i think that's probably a phenomenon that everyone listening to this is probably documented in their own lives as they've tried to bring this information up with their friends so uh, it, it would be nice to think that that t- type of apathy would extend into the sphere of the rah rah rally around the flag patriotism and you know when they're trying to rally us into war Unfortunately, I don't think, I mean, I think demonstrably this is not the case, because again, just about every time in recent history that they've needed to rally us into war to support their their agenda of global conquest, uh, it's been done fairly easily. Um, sometimes not so easily. I mean, 9-11 was not an easy thing to pull off, but they did, and it certainly worked absolutely very well as propaganda to uh, to basically promote the extension of U.S. global uh, military hegemon, and that worked brilliantly. And since then, I mean, there's been various narratives that have put out that have continued to motivate the public to support this imaginary war of terror, and now to support the uh, demonization of Russia in this new Cold War and all of this. It's going along quite well for these people. I think that the public apathy extends to those spheres where it is meant to extend to. And when people are asked to rally around the flag and rally against a, a, a demon, an enemy, a boogeyman that's been drawn, brought, drawn up by the, uh, the powers that shouldn't be, they will dutifully do so. I think that's part of the apathy is just going along with the herd. And in this case, the herd is going, for example, against with all of this rhetoric about Putin and uh, how he's the most dangerous person on the planet and all of this, so that you see, you know, places where you can get a finger on the pulse of the uh, the, the the young progressive youth who basically swallow whatever the government tells them. Um, on reddit.com, you can see that on the world news and, and places, uh, those types of subreddits, all it's all filled with the, the type of anti-Putin propaganda that people seem to swallow wholesale. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing to watch, but it is a phenomenon that's occurring. So I think the only conclusion that, uh, that seems possible is that the apathy, in fact, it works exactly in the opposite direction to what you're suggesting, Sea Devil. I think it works towards um, getting people to just go along with whatever war is presented to them. Now, there was an important point in which that did not happen, which was last year's run-up to the invasion of Syria, which did not happen because there was a mass public outcry against it, and uh, people were flooding their uh, their Congress uh, critters' uh, voice boxes with with uh, protest and people were spilling out onto the streets. That's the first time we've seen that in a number of years, to that degree anyway, and it did at least partially, I mean, I'm sure there were many other factors going on behind the scenes, but at least partially did contribute to the fact that we did not go into Syria with uh, bombs blazing at that time. So there is hope, but unfortunately, I don't think apathy is the hope. And so I think Still, it falls to us, the burden of, of all of us out there, to spread this message, this message of, uh, of the real agenda and what's really going on. Because people, again, are ultimately most likely to be motivated by self-interest. And if we can explain that it is certainly not in their self-interest to go along with this global war agenda, then we are at least potentially counteracting some of that apathy. All right, uh, next, uh, we're going to uh, switch back to the mailbag. We're going to go to an email from Anja, who writes, When I first discovered your website some years ago, I noticed right away that you were not on Facebook. Today, you are still not on Facebook. Pourquoi? Well, thank you for that, Anja. In fact, this is, again, one of those questions that I've received from a few different people in the last few weeks specifically. I'm not sure why these types of questions congregate in one uh, time period, but at any rate, yes, I am not on Facebook. I ne- oh, I can't say I never have been. I was briefly on Facebook back in 2007, uh, 2007, I believe, uh, because I wanted to check out what this phenomenon was all about that all of my friends were talking about, and I almost immediately 
deleted my Facebook and was never back since because I understood how fundamentally creepy uh, Facebook is. And that was even uh, around the time of the start of the Corbett Report before I was even well researched into these areas, but I immediately understood what was uh, creepy and not right about this. But uh, this has been said in many different ways. I've had uh, different media out there talking about this. I'll refer people, for example, to a uh, last word video report I did called FISA, Fi Facebook, and the End of Privacy. Um, but uh, there are many different ways to talk about why Facebook is fundamentally wrong and creepy and why it's an intelligence operation and all of this. But let's, let's go to a video that, in fact, I think is at least seven, maybe eight or nine years old by now. It's definitely outdated in terms of its... It's, uh, it's specific information, but I think the general point that it makes is still worth listening to. The first venture capital money totaled at $500,000 came to the Facebook from venture capitalist Peter Thiel, founder and former CEO of PayPal. He also serves on the board of radical conservative group Vanguard PAC. Further funding came in the form of $12.7 million from venture capital firm Excel Partners. Excel's manager, James Breyer, was former chair of the National Venture Capital Association. Breyer served on National Venture Capital Association's board with Gilman Louie, CEO of InQtel, a venture capital firm established by the Central Intelligence Agency in 1999. This firm works in various aspects of information technology and intelligence, including, most notably, nurturing data mining technologies. Breyer has also served on the board of BBN Technologies, a research and development firm known for spearheading the ARPANET of what we know today as the internet. In October of 2004, Dr. Anita Jones climbed on board BBN along with Gilman Louie. But what is most interesting is Dr. Jones' experience prior to joining BBN. Jones herself served on the board of directors for InQtel and was previously the director of defense research and engineering for the U.S. Department of Defense. Her responsibilities included serving as an advisor to the Secretary of Defense and overseeing the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. This goes farther than just the initial appearances. DARPA shot to national fame in 2002 when knowledge of the existence of the Information Awareness Office came to light. The IAO stated its mission was to gather as much information as possible about everyone in a centralized location for easy perusal by the United States government, including though not limited to internet activity, credit card purchase history, airline ticket purchases, car rentals, medical records, educational transcripts, driver's licenses, utility bills, tax returns, and any other available data. All of the above raises more questions than answers. Perhaps if the Facebook wishes to stay ethically sane, it should enact a policy. What happens in the Facebook stays in the Facebook. All right, so as I say, the information on that video may be a bit outdated, but I think the general point is very much to the point. And I think that uh, Facebook fundamentally is nothing more than a data mining trap. And uh, it gets progressively creepier over the years, the various things that they've done to try to invade more and more on the personal privacy of their users and to exploit that, uh, that for not only economic gain, which I think is the obvious thing that we can point to, but I think that the, uh, the question of the way that uh, these types of social media cooperate with uh, intelligence agencies is an extremely important one, and one that I hope is not too conspiratorial for the mainstream now that we've had at least uh, some of the, the revelations that we've had in recent years about the ways that the NSA and other agencies like that are acting. So uh, this is why I'm not on Facebook, and I never will be again at any rate, and uh, I'm not planning to be. I'm sure it would be a good way to spread this information to, to more new users, but at a certain point you just have to draw the line, and that's where I do draw that line. But that does, of course, raise the question of why I'm on YouTube, why I'm on Twitter, why I have a Google Plus account, and that's a good question to raise. Uh, and ultimately, again, it's a calculation of, is this going to be uh, effective for me to reach out to that matrix and grab people out of it? And Ultimately, for me, I have made that calculation that certainly YouTube uh, is uh, one of those those vehicles that I use because it is extremely effective in getting the word out to a wider audience than I ever possibly could without it, which goes towards this next question from David, who writes, With Google constantly trying to beat their dead horse, aka Google+, Plus, would it be wise to use alternatives like Daily Motion, Blip, or other alternatives to the colonoscopy to YouTube is becoming? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question, David, and extra points for using the word colonoscopy. Um, 
you're exactly right. I mean, there needs to be a significant alternative to YouTube for so many reasons, but because, I mean, obviously they can and have many times in the past taken down entire accounts of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, hundreds of videos, millions and millions of views. They've just taken accounts down, uh, sometimes with little or no explanation and have only reversed that when uh, when thousands and tens of thousands of outraged YouTube users have, have complained about that. So, I mean, obviously, any information you're putting up on YouTube is not safe. It's not your own. It's not there forever. I think you should always, of course, have backups of all the data you're putting up there. And we do need a viable alternative to YouTube. But it is a question of viable. I think that's the key word. And over the years, I've seen uh, an, a few different alternative type YouTube sites, specifically for alt media, come and go. Uh, there, uh, for example, there was Rational Veracity, which I was promoting on this podcast at one point that went under because it just simply couldn't be maintained. There weren't enough users and there wasn't enough traffic and there wasn't enough ad revenue for the person who was running it. And uh, ultimately it just failed. And that's going to be the case for a lot of these sites because video sharing platforms, especially if they're going to work, have to have a pretty large user base and have to have some sort of revenue because it's extremely expensive to run those types of servers. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to do that from an alt perspective. And even if you look at some of the alternatives, I've tried Blip. Um, they ultimately ended up removing my channel as long as, as well as pretty much every other alt media channel that I know of, like James Seven Pilato's Media Monarchy channel and all of the other channels because they didn't conform to the the community guidelines or the, 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 the type of direction they're taking Blip in or whatever it is. So Blip went to the wayside. I've tried Vimeo, but you can only upload, I think, three videos a week unless you buy an, uh, an upgraded account, which I suppose I could do. But again, it just seems, uh, it seems so somewhat silly and pointless because I have all that functionality in YouTube. I don't really delude myself that it's any different. Um, Daily Motion. I've had an account there. It's uh, it's cumbersome to upload. All of these things are not ideal solutions. And I think that the number one point of why I'm still on YouTube is that it is where the people are. And it's one of those chicken and egg questions. How do we move the people without moving ourselves off YouTube? And if we move ourselves off YouTube, we'll lose access to all those people that we want to convince to move off YouTube. So... <laughs> It is, I mean, it is a conundrum, and I don't pretend that it's an easily re resolvable one, um, but here we are. So I'm, I'm certainly, I'm always open to suggestions and ideas, but uh, so far, I think that it just makes more sense to be in that YouTube GooTube matrix. And I'm in it personally because I myself am consciously making the conscious decision to go in there to put this type of information out there. I certainly don't recommend anyone to create a YouTube account or a Google Plus account um, in order to just browse or, or use YouTube normally. I mean, if you're going to put out truthful information, that this is the place to do it, and you can potentially reach millions of people. I have nearly 20 million video views on YouTube right now, which is just an astounding figure, and one that I never would have even approached if I had confined myself to Daily Motion or Blip or what have you. So uh, so again, it's a place to reach out and to, to hopefully unlock some minds and, and get some people Get some get some minds opening and flowing, and uh, get people out of that matrix. So it is a it's a tightrope to walk, and at some point, I think there will have to be an exodus from YouTube. It's just a question of when and how, and maybe that will be decided for me when they suddenly yank my account for no good reason. All right. Um, well, moving right along, we'll go to Art, who has an important question. He writes a bunch of people that I ha have a continuing argument about 9/11 with. Uh, I and specifically WTC Building 7. Sorry, that, that sentence is, is incorrect. Okay, um, anyway, the, they claim the building came down due to structural damage to the building from the North Tower. I'm enclosing a picture that does show damage to the corner of WTC 7. My argument is that from the picture, there's no evidence of structural damage. And secondly, if that was the cause of the collapse, why didn't WTC 7 come down? That morning, and uh, that morning, and since the damage to the building was asymmetrical, then why did the building come down symmetrically eight hours later? Later, finally, if structural damage did bring down the building, then why was it not given as the cause in the NIST report? Okay, a very important question. As I say, this is important because this is something that it's an old canard that continues to come up. But I think the the key point is what you mentioned at the end of that question, Art, which is that this is not in the NIST report. The NIST final report was released in uh, November two thousand eight. 
and I'll put a link into the the uh, the press release so you can go and download the report itself and watch the video presentation that NIST gave at that time. But the key sentence from that press release about the final WTC WTC seven investigation is quote heating of floor beams and girders caused a critical support column to fail, initiating a fire induced progressive collapse that brought the building down. It was fire that, according to the official story, brought the building down, not the structural damage. Ultimately, NIST concluded that structural damage did not have anything to do with the actual initiation of that collapse. So that's an important part of this, because again, people will bring up that photo. Um, still, it continues to circulate, even though it, it, there are questions about that photo. And I will throw a link into a 9-11 blogger thread about that photo and debunking that photo. Unfortunately, every single photo in that 9-11 blogger thread has been since been removed it's it's seven years old uh, all of these files have been deleted or they're old or out of date or the links aren't working anymore so unfortunately this is this is another thing to keep in mind about the web is that just because it's up on the web today does not mean it will be up on the web tomorrow or seven years from now when it might be useful but anyway at any rate i did i was on that thread seven years ago i do remember it and it certainly at the time i remember they they showed the the comparisons of different photos of wtc7 etc and the 25 percent scooped out photo is uh, is at the very least an optical illusion that's generated by some of the smoke that's going on in that picture, and at very worst, an outright forgery. So um, at any rate, we can talk a little bit about the history of that photo and how it was used. I'll put in a link to uh, 911debunkers.blogspot, which talks uh, about that uh, that claim and how it was first posited in Appendix L of the 2004 Progress Report on WTC7. Cheyenne Sunder mentioned it in po the Popular Mechanics debunking article in 2005. Um, it was eventually retracted, and now it's not even mentioned at all um, in the NIST final report. So that that goes some ways towards telling how important that structural damage was, i.e. not even NIST claims it was important. So that's the first thing to bring up to your friends. NIST doesn't say that had anything to do with the collapse. Secondly, I think we should look at what NIST actually does say brought down the WTC7, the fire, the fire-induced collapse. And uh, a couple of things to say on that. First of all, please remember that the model that they used to, uh, to model the initiation of that collapse and uh, the model itself is just ridiculous when you look at the visualization of it and uh, expect to believe that that somehow explains the, the full progressive, well, beginning at freefall gravitational acceleration collapse of the building. Uh, it does not go any way towards that, I think. But at any rate, the data behind the model is completely 100% classified, literally classified. The public is not allowed to see it. And once again, this is a point I make in the 9-11 conspiracy theory video. I'll throw the link in here as well to the, uh, to the actual response that NIST gave to a Freedom of Information Act request for the data that went into the building of that model in which they say that it might jeopardize public safety if the public know about what data they used in that model. Therefore, NIST will not release the data. So that model is worth exactly what uh, what goes into it. And since we are not allowed to see what magic pixie dust went into the back end of that model, it is worth absolutely nothing. It tells us nothing whatsoever about the collapse of that building. So for a true really in-depth investigation of what uh, NIST claims about WTC7 and why it's a lie. I will wholeheartedly recommend the work of Kevin Ryan, who has really done the yeoman's work of really dissecting the WTC7 report and really exposing it for what it is. He did an interview on the Mind Renewed podcast recently that I'll link people to, which is, I think, a pretty good conversation about uh, about the, the, the claims about the WTC uh, collapses. And I will also include a link to a, a pretty comprehensive one-hour uh, video presentation uh, of Kevin Ryan's uh, presentation about the collapse of WTC7 and what NIST claims about it. That I, Again, it's pretty thorough and it goes through it point by point and I think does a very good job of debunking some of that, uh, that the NIST silliness. I mean, it's just... I, I, it, there are stronger words to be used, but let's keep this family friendly. So... Yes, uh, absolutely, 100%. There are good arguments to be made why NIST is full of it on WTC7, and the structural damage has nothing to do with it, even by NIST's own investigation. 
So again, a very important question, especially coming up to the 9-11 anniversary, where these types of questions will probably be kicked around once again. Uh, But moving on to a, uh, well, perhaps related question from Dan, who writes, Why does Amy Goodman not say she was at Building 7, report about Building 7, or support 9-11? Can you ask her? Uh, Thank you for that, Dan. Yes, uh, many people might not know this, but Amy Goodman was there live on the scene when WTC7 collapsed. There is footage of her there, um, so you can see that online. So you think she might be a little bit curious as to what happened while she was there in, uh, in on the ground in New York that day, but... Well, maybe not, because, of course, Democracy Now! does not cover 9-11 Truth. It had a debate back in the day, um, but really, other than that, it it hasn't covered this issue. It has not been an ongoing concern for Democracy Now! Democracy Now! does not talk about it. So, the question is, why does Amy Goodman not talk about it? And can I ask her about this? Well, of course not, because I have absolutely no connection to Amy Goodman, and she wouldn't give me the time of day. Uh, at all, because who am I? I'm just some blogger on the internet. Um, But that question has actually been uh, given to her many, many, many times by many different people with We Are Change and without We Are Change. Uh, There have been lots of people who've put this question to Amy Goodman, so let's, let's go to the video footage. I wanted to ask your comment. What do you think about World Trade Center Building 7, your opinion? Um, nope. I think it needs to be further investigated. One of my colleagues asked you a while ago what you thought about World Trade Center building number seven, and you said you thought it needed further investigation. And I was hoping you could let us know why you think it needs a further investigation. I think, the, I think everything needs further investigation. Specifically building seven, anything about it? I think that, I mean, I, I think we have to find, get a complete investigation of what actually took place. So you don't feel like 9 11 was fully, completely investigated by the 9 11 Commission? I think it does need. I don't I don't think the 9-11 commission You know, this, the group of citizen journalists who, you know, actually put together a lot of the independent investigation that you support on 9-11 has been attacked, ignored by The Nation magazine, by Mother Jones. What do you think about that? I just think that it needs to be investigated and we, um, you know, and we'll continue to look at the issue. But I, I have to All right. But Amy, okay. it has Thank been you. investigated and, you know, now we have, uh, you know, peer-reviewed uh, journal uh, papers of the evidence that the buildings were blown up. So now it's time for you to do your job and have the people on, please. All right, there you go. Make of those provisions and evasions what you will. And I think that uh, Amy said some things at some opportune times to get people out of her face and clearly has no intention whatsoever of following up on them. So I think the real point of this is, why do we care what Amy Goodman thinks? I mean, obviously she has an audience she could expose to this information, but it's not going to happen. I think we, after after 13 years of waiting for uh, Amy Goodman or some other reporter to descend from the heavens and offer this present the, this information to the public, I think at this point we can pretty much determine who's going to talk about this topic and who isn't. And Amy Goodman isn't. Um, so I think we should stop Stop giving up hope that Democracy Now! or the Young Turks or any of these types of uh, quote-unquote alternative uh, outlets are actually going to do any investigative work whatsoever on this issue. And instead, we're going to have to take it again into our own hands because, again... As as the, the commander-in-chief once said, we are the change we're looking for. So uh, uh, stealing some of the thunder, I think, from we are change itself in the process with that phrase. But anyway, um, again, I just don't think we can uh, sit around and twiddle our thumbs and wait for this to be covered in, uh, in one of those quote-unquote alternative media outlets. Because again, it doesn't even mean that these are evil people plotting to scheme and help the new world order and take over the world. Uh, these are just... Career journalists who know that their career would be over if they talked about this too deeply, so they don't. And again, that's the way it works. So uh, let's stop thinking that it will ever be otherwise. Uh, But again, this is a new paradigm, a new era. We have open source journalism. We are blazing a new trail. We do not need Amy Goodman. We do not need democracy now. We do not need uh, any of these outlets. And that's not to say that we can't celebrate the good work that they do and use the good work that they do. Um, They do do some good work, so let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but let's just not rely on them for reporting about 9-11 or some of the other topics that we talk about here. All right, uh, speaking of which, let's move on to a topic, a completely different topic, by uh, a question that we received via a SpeakPipe, the, the application that allows you to record a question for me. And uh, this one comes from Tony. 
I wonder whether it's possible for you to comment on the inclusion of secret societies into all forms of power, i.e. the financial powers run by secret society members like the Rothschilds. Um, the media, look at the logos run by secret society members. Governments, clearly run by secret society members. So, with this in mind, it would appear that if we need to know the truth about our situation, it would be the secret societies and their agenda that we would be looking at. So, anyway, there's my deal. I would ask you, if possible, to do an article or a piece on the secret societies and your point of view. All right, thank you for that, Tony. And don't worry, there are numerous resources on the occult and secret societies up on CorbettReport.com. I'll just run through a few of them. Of course, we've talked about the Bohemian Grove back in episode 42 of the podcast. Episode 93 was about Skull and Bones. Episode 137, we talked specifically about signs, symbols, sigils, logos, and uh, those types of occultic references in the, uh, in the mainstream. Uh, there was an episode of Corbett Report Radio on religion and the New World Order, and uh, I did an entire eye-opener series uh, at the beginning of 2013 talking about secret societies and culminating in an episode uh, that I hope people will watch or rewatch called Solutions, Defeating the Secret Societies. So this is clearly something that we've talked about many times. I think for my latest thinking on this matter, probably the best place to go would be the recent Beard World Order episode on how Bilderberg works and institutional analysis, where I put forward what I really think these secret societies are, what they're functioning um, to do, and I think there are multiple levels and layers depending on the audience uh, for the, this information, uh, right down from the general dumbed down public all the way up to the actual members of these secret societies themselves. And I think even within the secret societies, there's stratification between those members on the periphery, those members towards the interior, and then those in the very center who are puppeteering all of them. Uh, I think there's a lot going on here, and a lot of it plays on psychological factors. The fundamental key psychological factor that uh, is very effective, because I think it works on almost everyone, is the idea of holding out holding out information on people and suggesting that they can get more if they work harder and work farther and work their way up the ladder. You can find out the truths, the hidden truths, the secret truths at the core of this. It doesn't even matter if those secret truths exist. Simply using them motivationally to keep people working towards your agenda can be exceptionally effective. And I think that's how a lot of these groups do work. And it's, uh, it's very, very insidious because, again, so many people are motivated by curiosity. So I think there's a lot to be said. Again, there's a ton of different resources. I'll put those links that I mentioned specifically in the show notes so you can go and explore those, uh, those, those issues. If anyone has any specific questions about uh, any of these secret societies, I'd be happy to answer that as well. Uh, let's move on to uh, Chris, who has a quick, simple question. Do you use peer block? Uh, quick, simple answer. No, I don't. Uh, if people are interested in what various uh, types of tools and add-ons and, and, uh, and programs that I use in my own work, uh, they can go to an episode of Corbett Report Radio number 208, Solutions Hacking the Matrix, where I talk about some of the various add-ons and things that I use to, uh, to do my own web surfing. Uh, if someone wants to... But I, 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 to be honest, um, have either never heard of Pure Block or have never really been introduced to it. If someone would like to tell me why I should be using it, I'm all ears. Uh, let's move on to the next question. We have one coming in from Matt who writes, James, what do you think of the zeitgeist movement? Is there a term you use for your worldview? Uh, thank you for the answer, Matt. I think the there's a couple of places where I've articulated in my general uh, misgivings about the zeitgeist movement and its associated Lucifer, I mean, Venus project. Uh, for example, Against Utopia, um, an edition of the Last Word video series, and episode 217 of the podcast, Against Technocracy, I think are very much to the point of dispelling the idea that the resource-based economy is truly something new, different, or revolutionary. In fact, this has been talked about for at least a century, the idea of having this 
uh, scientist scientific way of trying to decide how to to run the economy and uh, and a lot of the very same ideas were talked about in the technocratic movement of the last century including the idea of using energy as a form of of, uh, of currency of, of, of resource to be to be exchanged and, and things of that nature again a lot of these ideas have been kicking around for a very long time and fundamentally I do not agree with them I do not believe that they will work central planning simply will not work and it certainly will not work for some supercomputer with some algorithm that some supposedly exists but no, none of us have ever seen that can somehow make all of the various economic determinations and calculations based on the varying in and competing interests and values of seven and a half billion people or whatever it is now seven billion people uh is just on its pace on its face patently ridiculous again economic determinations come down to uh, competing interests and competing values and those are also in flux what one, what one person values or is interested in in society today is not necessarily what they will be interested in tomorrow. And to have a system where apparently this is going to be solved by some supercomputer divvying up the resources and deciding what we need in order to function as a, as a species, um, just patently ridiculous. So I don't subscribe to it at all, but I think that the better point to be made here, and one that I've made numerous times, including in my recent interview on the Greening Out podcast, is... Why should you care what I believe? If you're a supporter of the zeitgeist movement or whatever type of movement, and I don't agree or con concur with you, who cares? Go and prove me wrong. That is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate test is going to be in reality, not in argumentation. So if you think that a supercomputer is going to be able to run the world, well, why don't you go create your community and build it up and, uh, and show me that I'm wrong about this 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 problem and I'll gladly eat my hat and ask for seconds and come join you once I've been proven wrong in reality but a lot of people like to talk about and argue about these ideas rather than actually implement them so um, so that's where I stand on that as to my own worldview what I term I use for my worldview um, freedom would be the best term single word I guess obviously it's a loaded term so um, as less of a cop-out, I use the voluntarist label. I think just free and peaceful interactions between human beings is going to be the way forward for us as a species. Either that or we perish. I, I really do think of it in those terms. Either we will find a way to live with the fact that people will disagree with us and people will want to do their own thing and other people will do things that we disagree with. Uh, and as long as they're not infringing on us... Who are we to tell them what to do? Um, again, that's a very difficult thing for human beings to be able to process. And until the human species collectively comes to that understanding that we have to be able to leave people to do things, even things that we disagree with in, the, uh, in, their, own, in their own space, in their own time to themselves then until we start to get over that mindset that we must control everything and everyone must must agree with us, everyone on the planet must be in conformity with our wishes, until we can get past that childlike urge, we are on the risk of global extinction. And that will continue as we are uh, continue to creep towards the precipice of a third world war and all of the craziness and zaniness, zaniness that comes from basically continuing to abrogate that fundamental free and peaceful interaction between human beings that again, I think is the only way forward for us as a species. So uh, that's a long response to a simple question. But at any rate, let's move on to the next question. Minty writes, do you have a list of the news outlets or websites that you'd like to speak to? Uh, if not, who are the top 10 people that you'd like to interview you? Uh, thank you for this, Minty. This is in response to my call in recent weeks for people to write into your favorite podcast or, or radio host and ask them to have me on to talk about the Federal Reserve documentary. And I do want to thank everyone who's taken, you know, 90 seconds out of their day to do that. It really does make a difference. And for example, we were recently on usawatchdog.com, I think as a direct result of people out there basically pestering Greg to have me on. So I do appreciate it. It really does help. As to what outlets or websites I would like people to to write into. Again, I want to leave it up to you guys out there because obviously you guys will be able to uh, to f discover all sorts of radio shows and podcasts that I don't even know exist. So I'm happy to have that. Um, but obviously, I mean, there I think there are some some obvious uh, candidates out there, um, whether that be a Red Ice Radio or Breaking the Set or a Tom Woods show or um, anything that 
you think is in the ballpark of what I'm doing and what I'm talking about here, I would be happy to uh, to speak again to any media outlet that wants to have me on to talk about this Federal Reserve documentary. So your support on that is very much appreciated. Uh, let's turn to an email from Stephen who writes, I will look around your recommended reading list from the subscriber issues I started getting, but I was wondering if you had something compiled and ready to send, because I'm sure others have asked the same of you. Well, you are absolutely right about that, Stephen. Many, many people have asked the same of me. And in fact, just in the last month or so of this last QFC period, I've had a few different people writing in asking for a reading list. And uh, it's funny the regularity with which I get this question. I think we've even covered it in a previous Questions for Corbett, but we'll cover it here again. Uh, In the previous Questions for Corbett, I took the cop-out response, which isn't really a cop-out, of saying there is a reading list in every single episode of every podcast that I do, and in most of the interviews that I do, actually, as well most of the work that I do has a reading list of tons of links to different sources, articles, uh, reading resources, all sorts of things on there. So the best thing to do if you have a specific topic that you want recommendations on, please just type that search uh, term into the search bar on CorbettReport.com and click on whatever related podcast or whatever comes up. I guarantee you there will be some information there. As long as I've covered the topic, there will be information that you can uh, click on. And and uh, trust me, the amount of things that I've linked to would take any normal human, human being uh, a, a very, very long time to ever possibly read. So there's tons and tons of information linked up on Corbett Report right now. Um, and that's truly the best way to go about doing it. Find a topic you're interested in and, and search that way. But I know people always want book recommendations. I don't know why, but at any rate, let's go through a few of them that I think are uh, worth going through. And as we're approaching 9-11, obviously, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in researching that. Here's a pretty basic suggestion. Um, I don't think that this should be a surprising suggestion, but read the 9-11 Commission report. If you haven't yet done so, read the report. Read the official story. Read what they want the public to believe and their their narrative and the, and, uh, the footnotes and their information that they relied on to, to compile this report. It's important to understand what the, the propaganda they want us to believe in order to deconstruct it. So I think there are probably a lot of people out there in the truth movement who have never read this report. And I think it does a disservice to us and our ability to counteract the propaganda by not actually addressing it and not actually taking a look at it. Um, I certainly got a lot out of reading it for myself, so I think others will as well. Of course, we have to supplement that with reading on other matters. For example, Black 9-11 by by Mark Gaffney talking about the financial aspects to what happened on 9-11, I think is an important... uh, important work on that subject. So again, obviously, let's let's counteract the 9-11 Commission propaganda, but we should understand what it's saying. Uh, on the GMO issue, again, I've recommended it before, I'll recommend it again. Seeds of Destruction by William Engdahl, the best single work on the GMO issue and why it's important, and Monsanto and how that plays into the, uh, the entire world agenda for control of the food supply. I mean, that's important, uh, absolutely, and uh, William Engdahl always does a good good job of pretty much everything, every book that he writes. So uh, so that one, no, no exception. Um, in the listening to the enemy vein, like in the 9-11 Commission report, why don't you go and read Machiavelli's The Prince? It's often talked about, often cited as one of those foundational works for a New World Order type mentality of complete, well, Machiavelli, Machiavellian thinking of how to manipulate and, uh, and strategize in order to gain power and to rule over people. Um, why not go to the source and read it for yourself so you know exactly what where that's coming from? Um, the uh, the CFR, if you're interested in the CFR as a type of secret society, not so secret, kind of a public secret society, and how it functions and what it's done in the past, again, the best single volume on that you'll ever find, The Shadows of Power by, uh, by James Perloff, and you can follow that up with our interview on, on this book. Um, again, extremely important book, and uh, he, James Perloff has done a number of presentations that are widely available online on this, so absolutely important information in there, a highly recommended book. Um, and if she, since it can't be news and politics all the time, if you want to explore the human condition rather than simply just dwell on all of these uh, nasty things that go on in the world... I will give my recommendation for my favorite book of all time, Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner, which I think is the most beautifully written book in the English language. But I certainly understand there are many people who will violently disagree with me on that. So if you do not like literary type works, 
don't bother reading this. <laughs> but if you do like literary books, I think, for my money, Absalom Absalom is the best book in the English language, and that's a pretty bold claim, but I'll make it nonetheless. So there you go. There's some recommended reading. Again, there's a million other books that we could recommend, but it depends on the topic. So again, please do search each individual topic via the, the website. Okay, we are running completely out of time. We're actually over time. So let's wrap this up. Again, uh, as always, I just want to wrap this up with a positive note. And this time we'll go to a positive note that uh, that we didn't get to last time, but I'll, I'll throw it in here uh, from Garrett, who writes, uh, I live in a college town that has just started to burst at the seams with the truth, mo- truth movement, and I feel all they need now is to be exposed to level-headed information. Your work has inspired me to host the next March Against Monsanto, the Global Reddit Service Day in October, and Students for a Sensible Drug Policy Festival in my town. Uh, Later this year, a libertarian organization I am a part of is starting up an all-local radio station that will also post to the internet. I know it's quite a stretch, but I was going to ask you later down the line if you would be willing to do an interview when it gets up and going. All right, thank you for that, Garrett. It's awesome. It's always awesome to hear about people taking this information and spreading it and getting involved in actively organizing and doing things and getting people interested and motivated and taking part in marches against Monsanto and all of these things. It's always great to hear that. So my hat's off to you, Garrett, for getting involved in that. Of course, I'm happy to be on a guest on on whatever podcast or radio show anyone out there wants to start up. I'm always happy to do that. It can be difficult to schedule me sometimes, so you'll forgive me, but I will do my best to, to be on, and I'll be on with you, Garrett, as uh, if that's possible as well. Uh, as, as a slight update to this, uh, since the time that Garrett wrote that original one, I've, I've come to understand that that radio station surprisingly enough, got bogged down in licensing and bureaucratic red tape so that it looks like it's not going to go ahead after all. So Garrett's just decided to uh, pluck up and start his own podcast. So again, I'll be happy to be on Garrett's podcast when and if that that eventuates uh, somewhere down the line. So uh, again, my hat's off to people like Garrett who are taking this information and running with it because that's the only way it will truly spread. So I think we're going to leave it on that note, an optimistic note to leave things on. Once again, I do appreciate all your questions. Uh, Keep them coming in. I do apologize if I don't get to your question in particular. It's just uh, we have a limited amount of time to work with. But I do appreciate all the questions and comments that do come in. And I'm looking forward to talking to you again real soon.